Thank you, Hans Ulrich, and thank you, Uta, also for allowing me to share this session. I feel um, I feel really intimidated by all these speakers. I think the only person who's who's missing here is James Ewing, and I I, I suspect that you have him somewhere hidden and and witnessing this these all these spectacular talks so that is it's i'm super impressed so i'm a medical oncologist here in essen as well um i'm very happy uta that you came to essen and i think 149 participants at 6 30 friday night that speaks for itself for the success of this meeting and um, that's really awesome so Let's start the last meeting or the last chair session of today, which is entitled uh, Relapse in Ewing Sarcomas, New Ideas and New Ideas in Terms of Trials and also Innovations from Bench to Bedside. And the first speaker is Martin Mc McCabe. He's a pediatric and um, adolescent and young adult medical oncologist, and he happens to be uh, the chief investigator for the RECUR trial that most of you, of course, know. It's a trial that I truly envy coming from the soft tissue sarcoma world because it, it really answers and aims to answer questions that are not funded by the industry, but that matter so much in clinical practice, uh, which is which chemotherapy to choose when a relapse, relapse happens. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what your current update is. Thank you very much. I hope you can see that. Uh, please do tell me if you can't. Um, yeah. So, great. Uh, thank you very much, Uta, for asking me. I also, uh, uh, as everybody else has said, I feel quite honoured to be among a very stellar cast, and I hope I give a good presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk about the development of the Recur trial and the, the most uh, recent update that I can give. And just to start by saying that this is a trial that was developed within the Area Ewing Consortium, and actually that is a major strength that we have. It's a major strength that we have in Europe. Uh, because Recur because was developed by the EEC, it has EEC in the, in, the, in the title. And actually, I have a real problem when I write Recur in normal English because I have to remind myself how it's written and it only has one E. Anyway, these are my disclosures. And I'm presenting this on behalf of the whole trial management group. Sorry, Martin, I have muted you. Due per incidence, please unmute yourself okay. again. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Sorry. So when we set Recur up in 2014, there were multiple chemotherapy regimens in use across the world for relapsed disease, of which probably the most common and popular was erinotecan and temozolomide. Even within those regimens, there were multiple dosing schedules. Uh, and for each chemotherapy regimen, there was a, a variable number, but still a small number of reports, most of which had very small number of patients with different outcome variables, by which I mean there were almost all reported uh, response, but some re reported response after one cycle, two cycles, four cycles, best response, and therefore we really could not compare them. There was no randomized evidence for chemotherapy. I think the only randomized trial at that time was one of the SARC, uh, the SARC regorafenib study. Most regimens didn't have survival data reported and there was virtually no quality of life data. We knew, however, from the various series that had been reported, particularly the German series, that survival was poor. So, um, and although we didn't know this in 2014, because this paper was only published this year, this was uh, some work done by the Children's Oncology Group that describes uh, seven sequential phase two trials in relapsed Ewing's uh, between 1997 and 2007. And again, me median survival was about two months. And again, not very good, not, for, not because of want of trying. So to give an example of how variable the evidence was, this was the evidence that we had for irinotec and temozolomide, which as I said, was the most common regimen. So it was made up of a mix of phase one uh, and single center or multi-center retrospective studies. Uh, most uh, studies used the two drugs, the uh, American studies tended to use uh, VIT, so the addition of vincristine. If you look at the number of patients in each of these reports, they were generally small, 
and there was a fivefold variation in the dose of irinotec and temozolomide, uh, whether it was given intravenously or orally. The, there was actually more published on irinotec and temozolomide than any other regimen, but, but this gives a flavour of uh, how weak the evidence was. And of course, this isn't limited to Ewing's. It is it's quite typical of lapsed paediatric cancer. So the objectives we set out were to compare chemotherapy regimens in recurrent and refractory Ewing uh, to identify the best with respect to both efficacy, toxicity and acceptability. And in, in fact, what sold it to some of the funders was that we wanted to identify a backbone for the addition of novel therapies. Although, in fact, that's easier said than done, because, of course, the backbone you choose also depends on the toxicity of the backbone and the new therapies. This was the design as it was set out. So we had a four, four arms that we were comparing. Uh, we could have chosen more, but we thought four was about as many as we could tolerate in Europe and patients could be randomized between any two, three or four of these. We decided in advance that because the disease was so rare and it was going to be quite challenging to recruit patients, that we would drop one arm after all regimens had recruited 50 patients, however, the, however small the difference between the arms. We would then drop a second arm after 75 patients had been recruited to all four arms, uh, or the remaining three arms rather. Again, that, that arm would be dropped, however small the difference. And the, we would then go on to phase three evaluation. And various modeling was done, which I'll come on to later. Uh, and we estimated that with at least 200 patients in the remaining two arms, we would be able to have uh, reasonable confidence at a phase three level uh, about the decision that we made at the end. So the primary outcome when we started was resist objective response after cycle four. That changed uh, recently to event-free survival, which in fact was the endpoint we always wanted, but we couldn't do power calculations on EFS because they just hadn't been reported enough in the previous uh, papers with a variety of fairly standard secondary outcomes. The inclusion and exclusion criteria were as broad as they possibly could be to maximise the number of patients we uh, we could recruit. Importantly, we included Ewing and Ewing-like sarcoma. We required histological confirmation, but as Steve said in his talk earlier, there was no central pathology review, and I suspect a lot of these cases were probably diagnosed on fish. Uh, the age criteria were four to 50 uh, years, although we've recently lowered the lower age, age to two and there is no upper age limit as long as patients are well enough to receive treatment. Uh, fairly standard exclusion criteria. Uh, it is a multi-arm, multi-stage, adaptive, randomised phase two, three trial. As I said, patients could be randomised between any two, three or four arms. And importantly, patients and physicians could choose not to be randomised to certain arms. Uh, again, we wanted to maximise recruitment. Uh, because of it is an adaptive design, we had the facility to introduce or drop new, uh, in introduce and drop new arms. Uh, but importantly, in the, in the analysis, only concurrently randomised patients would be compared at any analysis time point. And we adopted a likelihood Bayesian approach. Um, so this shows the potential of the adaptive design. If we wanted to bring new arms in, we could, as we dropped arms, as long as there are enough patients uh, who could uh, support the trial. Um, and the, uh, the phase three comparison would include patients recruited on day one, as long as they were contemporaneously randomized. The, the benefit of this is, of course, is that it's much more efficient to compare multiple arms in a single trial rather than having multiple two arm trials. Uh, at the, as I said, we decided to drop phase two arms rapidly if they look to be less effective. Uh, so just coming on to some of the results, uh, the study is now open actually in 17 countries and two continents. So uh, what isn't on this map is that we recently opened Austria. Uh, as expected from previous reports, uh, the majority of patients were male. And the, actually one of the successes of this study is that we recruit the majority of patients we recruited were either adolescents or and young adults or slightly older adults. And, and this is something that we saw as a success because a lot of the first line trials are not so good at recruiting adults. Since the start, we've been slightly under our initial target. Uh, accrual has certainly fallen off since the pandemic, but also since we dropped to a two arm study, not surprisingly, but we are continuing to recruit. So just looking at some of the stratification factors, 
we stratified by type and uh, timing of relapse. So we split into refractory disease, first relapse within two years, first relapse beyond two years and any subsequent relapse. And importantly, 85% of our patients overall are in their first progression. So we're really getting patients early on in their disease trajectory. About 15% of patients had local progression only. A, a, a further 30% um, had pluripulmonary metastatic disease and just over half had other metastatic disease. We also had to stratify initially on whether patients had resistant measurable disease or not because the primary outcome was uh, resist response and just over 10% uh, have had non-measurable disease. Again, importantly, this, this trial is a, re a significant repository of biological samples. So we have just over 100, um, uh, we have samples from just over 100 patients at baseline uh, and the number falls as, as, as the trial progresses. We only have a small amount of frozen tissue, but we also theoretically have uh, FFP tissue on 50 patients at recurrence, although we're trying to look into how we're actually going to get hold of that now. So this data has been presented in ASCO 2019. So the first arm to be dropped was the gemcitabine docetaxel arm in November 2018, and it was dropped on the basis of worse imaging response, but also uh, PFS and overall survival. And given the observed data at the time, there was a 3%, 7%, and 22% likelihood that gemcitabine docetaxel was better than the other arms at PFS. Uh, the, ooh, hold on. Uh, yeah, uh, so the second uh, arm was dropped in March 2020, and, and that was irinitic and temozolomide, which was a, a difficult uh, piece of information to give to the community. Uh, but we had to follow the statistical rules of the study. And at the time that that was dropped, there was a 7% likelihood that irinitic and temozolomide was better than the best arm, and a one in three likelihood was better than the second best arm. So, I mean, not surprisingly, these survival curves are fairly close together and arguably there's very little difference uh, between erinitic and temozolomide and the other arms. And certainly using a frequentist approach, this would just have been classed as a negative trial. Uh, the most recent arm, again, somewhat surprisingly, was finally close to recruitment just a couple of months ago, and that was the topotec and cyclophosphamide arm. Unfortunately, I would love to give you the actual results of this, but we haven't presented them in public yet. Uh, and so I can't really tell you any data other than that the recommendation was made on the basis of worse eventry and overall survival. Importantly, uh, once the second arm was dropped, the, the trial theoretically went into a phase two comparison, although there were still phase, uh, sorry, a phase three comparison, although there were still phase two comparisons ongoing because we had brought in a carboplatinum and top side arm. I say this was surprising because we weren't expecting anything to happen until there were at least 200 patients in each arm. And actually the DMC made the decision after when there were only 70 patients in each of the topotec and cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide arms. So the differences were striking enough uh, for them to initially recommend temporarily suspending recruitment and subsequently closing recruitment entirely. Uh, I hope the data will be presented in ASCO next year. That's certainly our plan. And our plans for 2022 and beyond is that we will plan to introduce a novel arm with ifosamide and a TKI. Uh, and uh, we're, we're just going through contract negotiation with the uh, industry partner involved with that. So just coming on to some keys or successes of Recur, as far as I know, it's the largest clinical trial collaboration to date in Ewing sarcoma, and certainly in terms of numbers of countries and sites. We had good recruitment across children and adults. Of course, we don't know what the denominator population was, so we don't know what proportion of patients with relapsed disease went into it, but certainly a large proportion of patients were older, which is encouraging. Uh, there are now more randomised patients uh, treated in the four arms than in all of the previous studies combined. So, you know, we've really uh, changed uh, the landscape here in, in going from no randomised evidence at all to uh, proper randomised evidence for all of these four arms, with the fifth arm uh, now collecting data. 
obviously this design is a highly efficient comparison of multiple chemotherapy regimens in a rare tumor but it has its challenges because we had to make some statistical decisions at the outset that in retrospect might not have been very popular because we were dropping arms on the basis of relatively weak evidence but that's something that we had to do in a very rare situation uh, recruitment has continued through the pandemic thanks to all of the sites who've uh, recruited patients and as I mentioned it is a major repository of biological samples. Some of the challenges so initially for the first five years we had European Commission funding which is the only reason we could get the trial off the ground <clears throat> and since that came to an end uh, several countries have got their own funding um, uh, and actually the, the uh, UTA was uh, very successful in getting German funding as one of the first countries to open, um, uh, sorry, the first uh, countries to get their own national funding. We've also had several countries join along the way, so Australia, New Zealand and Switzerland joined in 2018. Uh, although UTA had funding for Germany, it actually took several years to open uh, German sites for various reasons and Austria has still opened. So trial setup is a, is a major problem and, and, you know, it will always be so for a rare cancer. Some of the lessons we learned. So Bayesian design is another way of viewing the same data. Obviously, there's the data that are coming in uh, are the same. Uh, th there's been a lot of dissent between statisticians in different countries and organisations about the design, particularly the issue of whether you can define a trial as phase three if you don't have a standard arm, which of course there was no standard arm for elapsed viewings. Uh, and clinicians, um, I think we still are very uncomfortable about it because we like to see uh, very small p-values. The, the dropping of irinotec and temozolomide was a real challenge because it was everybody's favourite regimen. And then when um, uh, ifosamide became the winner of the four, it was really unpopular, including with members of the trial management group. And we've had some robust discussions about why the, why the DMC must have got it wrong, why the data must be wrong. Uh, and actually, we can't find a reason why anybody has got anything wrong. And in fact, ifosamide is, is the most effective regimen as far as we can see, but that's not popular with patients or us. Importantly, we have set a standard for chemotherapy outcomes in relapsed disease with a median PFS of five months uh, uh, and overall survival of about 12 months, which is a lot better than, than most of the very exciting targeted drugs coming through. We've shown that imaging response is not the right endpoint for elapsed disease because uh, I, I didn't talk about this in this talk, but actually non-progression is a much better correlator with survival than uh, imaging response. And very importantly, we're thinking about backbones. We have comparative data on the relative toxicity uh, between the regimens, which previously was not in existence. Um, and that will pre be presented next year, hopefully. And it's actually quite an important outcome of this study. So finally, I just would like to make the point that this has been a huge collaborative study with a lot of input and effort from a very large number of people internationally. Uh, and uh, all of the major tri uh, sarcoma groups in Europe have taken part and there have been a lot of independent funders. So my thanks to all of those. So thank you, Martin. That's, it's a super impressive trial and con congratulations for conducting that. I don't see any questions in the chat. I have one, gemcitabine docetaxel dropped out very quickly, but there still is a long tail. What is your take on, on GD? So I mean, it, it's not it, it, I mean, our message really consistently has been that none of these regimens are ineffective. They are all active. We're really trying to pick the best of a bad bunch. Obviously, we're, nobody expected this to dramatically improve survival in, in relapsed viewings because we know it's bad. But what we wanted to do was have comparative efficacy and importantly, toxicity data. And actually, one of the things I'm very excited about showing when we eventually show this data is the quality of life data, because it is somewhat surprising. Right. Thank you. We're actually um, very good in time, but we will go um, ahead with the next talk and uh, Professor Groha um, introduced himself already a little earlier today. Um, again, he is um, Director of Translational Cancer Research at the Center of Childhood Cancer Research at the Children's Hospital um, in Philadelphia. And he's presenting 
a clinical trial on a combination of trabectidin and uh, arenotecan, which actually is a true translational effort because it, it was preceded by um, preclinical research that led to that particular trial set up. Patrick, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. You can hear me and see my slides? Yes. Great, wonderful. Well, like other speakers, I'd like to acknowledge what an honor it is to present alongside of so many wonderful uh, scientists. So we've heard a lot about James Ewing today appropriately. One thing that I wanted to point out is that we've heard about how he returned from Europe with radium and brought it to New York. Well, I think one thing that we can say today is sort of celebrate that as over 100 years of, of international collaboration uh, against this awful disease. And I think that this symposium today highlights that, but, but really it all started with James Ewing. Another thing about him that I've sort of channeled in my own career is this idea that he had that the best hope of advancing knowledge in cancer was to study the disease in patients. And so as I've built my lab, I've sort of built it around this idea of trying to bring the bench and the bedside as close together as possible with perhaps the link being via drug mechanism. So we had, had identified some active agents, uh, trabectidin for one, uh, that others in the community, Enrique and Katia had published on, have published very nice manuscripts on through the years. But we, we reasoned that perhaps by digging in on the mechanism of these compounds, we could identify second generation versions that are better, better novel combination therapies and perhaps repurpose these compounds for other indications. Of equal import, we reasoned that perhaps if we, re if we could link clinical trial design to specific mechanisms of the drug, we may have more effective translation first to preclinical models and then to patients. And then in theory, we could design clinical trials that uh, had enough correlative biology to teach us about the biology of high-risk disease. And in many ways, trabectin arenotecan is and this trial that's just called SARC-37 is the realization of this general vision. But all of our work is built on the you know, work of many others in the community. And so first I'd like to you know, pay uh, due tribute to these two manuscripts in particular. We heard about Olivier's efforts to clone the translocation uh, earlier today, but you know, it's been 25 years since Heinrich Kovar uh, published a paper that showed the dependence of this tumor on EWS fly, which, which of course means that Heinrich published that paper when he was 11. But otherwise, this observation has held up over many years and, and by many different molecular techniques. And so after a bit of gap in time, we and several other labs have worked to identify inhibitors. In 2011, we published a paper that trabectin and reversed EWS fly transcriptional activity, and we showed that in a number of ways of specific targets, genome-wide, using, using a published meta-analysis. And then my favorite piece of data was that we could actually take EWS fly, move it into another cell context, activate a reporter, and then rescue that activation with trabectin. Not long after that publication, we sought to develop combination therapies, and we just made the simple observation about the EWS fly transcriptome that had been published by others that one of the major classes of genes that were driven by EWS fly were DNA damage response genes. And so we reasoned that perhaps we could turn off some of these DNA damage response genes and selectively, or at least with some preference, sensitize Ewing sarcoma cells to treatment to a second agent. And so we used our microarray data at the time and just looked for genes that change in expression and found this Werner Gila case that uh, markedly reduced in expression with treatment with trabectidin. Now, the function of the Werner Gila case is to resolve stalled replication forks. So it follows that it had been shown that these cells, cells deficient in WRN are hypersensitive to arenotecan. And so we showed across multiple cell lines that indeed uh, si treatment with EWS or silencing of EWS flyer treatment with trabectidin reduced WRN and sensitized the cells to SN38. We made a number of other observations. What was quite interesting is that the, the trabectidin actually led to an S phase arrest. And of course, uh, SN38 is more active in S phase. And Alex Bishop subsequently published a paper that showed the contribution uh, of R loops to sensitivity to arenotecan. And so it's not surprising that we could show, as in this single cell confocal micrograph, that there was an increase in uh, gamma H2X and DNA double strand breaks with the combination of trabectin and SN38 much more markedly than either agent alone. But SN38 and arenotecan also has impact on transcription. So both there's probably topoisomerase one independent mechanisms that have been described in the literature, but certainly topoisomerase one inhibition does impact uh, transcription. And so um, it wasn't surprising to see that they also 
the combination led to amplification of, of uh, EWS fly suppression. But more recently, we've wondered like, what does it do in vivo and, and how can we use this uh, nonspecific transcriptional effect to sustain EWS fly suppression? And we've gained recent insight based on this idea that we had that we could develop a, a biomarker of EWS fly suppression, perhaps a pet imaging biomarker that we could translate to patients. And so the idea was, if we could simply identify a cell surface protein driven by EWS fly, we could, in, in theory, silence EWS fly with trabectidin. We'd lose this expression, and a tumor could go from hot to cold on PET scan. And so this there's clearly would be a valuable biomarker as we move this compound from the bench to the bedside. So we just screened a series of tracers that were available at the institution that were linked to specific protein targets. We did siRNA silencing in multiple cell lines and confirmed target suppression and, and identified you know, a pretty well-established tracer called 18FFLT. And indeed, we went on to show that, that the nucleoside transporters responsible for transporting this radio-labeled thymidine into cells and the TK1 protein, which phosphorylates and traps this tracer once it's intracellular, uh, were all driven by EWS fly in the cell lines that we examined. And in, interestingly, this TK1 gene was independently identified by the Meltzer lab as a target of EWS fly, so it all fit. Um, and we were able to show that indeed that this idea that the tumor would go hot to cold with um, EWS fly suppression uh, was real. And this is some data that, I, that we have not published, but speaks to the idea that I just brought up about how could we employ a you know, sort of nonspecific transcriptional inhibitor to, to improve the suppression of EWS fly. And so these are pet images of, of uh, animals that um, uh, were given trabectidin or the combination um, and also received the 18F FLT pet imaging. So it's, it's, the nice thing about this is that we can you know, look at the same animal over time and suppression over time. Um, even, even though it's not exactly the perfect biomarker, but nonetheless, um, here is a, here's a mouse bearing a xenograph. You can see it's quite hot on PET. This is just a bladder where the tracer is secreted, and you can see it remains hot over time. When we treat with trabectidin, there's certainly silencing by day one uh, with recovery somewhere be, uh, between 24 and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, here at 24 and somewhere between 24 and 48 hours, there's recovery. When we add in the arenatecan on day two and day four, you can see that the tumors are colder than with single agent trabectidin, and they remain cold for the entire duration of therapy. More importantly, you can actually see uh, in this uh, uh, image the uh, tumor regressing in the animal. And I'm getting the same yellow lines that, um, that Heinrich was getting. So maybe if I switch to this pointer, that'll help. So in essence, the, the, we've used this assay to show and confirm in vivo that arenatecan in combination with trabectidin not only increases the DNA damage, but serves to amplify and sustain EWS fly suppression. And, and I'll tell you, we've done a number of studies, uh, some published, some unpublished, where there is sort of this critical duration of suppression that you need to achieve with EWS fly in order to see you know, striking tumor regressions. Hmm. Okay, and so, you know, consistent with this defined mechanism, we did in fact see really quite striking synergy in in vivo models. And so what we originally reported in, in our uh, manuscript in 2014, this is just a graph of tumor volume. Um, each of these uh, dots represent an individual animal on a specific day of treatment. And you can see there's some suppression with trabectidin, some suppression with arenatecan across the cohort, but all the animals, uh, but, but together there was just a non-subtle elimination of tumors. And this translated to an increase in survival, despite the fact that we only treated for about one day, or, or I'm sorry, one, one course. Actually, in this, it was two weeks of therapy and it land, la lasted long beyond 70 days. More recently, I've gone back to regraph this data, and you can see that indeed the drug combination causes striking regressions of tumors um, uh, in every animal in the cohort. We've also looked at a number of other parameters around sensitivity. Uh, to this agent and this combination. And again, in multiple different models, we see striking tumor regressions in every animal treated with the combination in the preclinical models. And we've shown it also with Lerbinectid and Arenatecan, which we've published and, and um, some of which we haven't published. And this, this one is not published. This is in a PDX model that we have in the laboratory. 
Okay, and so the last uh, uh, point about this combination is, you know, I mentioned that perhaps we could use mechanism to guide schedule. Indeed, we've shown that the suppression of EWS fly is in fact strikingly schedule dependent, where it requires achieving a specific threshold of drugs. So in these experiments, we compare the same drug exposure where exposure equals concentration times time, comparing a threshold exposure to a continuous exposure. So treat the cells for eight for one hour with 18 animal or trabectin and wash it out, collect lysate 17 hours later versus just one nanomolar for a total of 18 hours. And only in excess of a threshold uh, do we see suppression of WRN, EZH2, or NROB1 in multiple models. And that's highlighted in lane three on the left and the CMAX high exposure on the right. The effect on cell proliferation is, is also, oh, I'm sorry. So, and additionally, this mechanism of nuclear redistribution of VWS fly that we just described also only occurs with the high CMAX exposure. Um, in, the, in this experiment, I'm staying for EWSR1, nucleolin, or the merge. And you can see the relocalization of EWS fly with the CMAX high that persists long after drug removal. And there's no redistribution, despite the fact that this, uh, these cells actually saw more trabectin in. And the effect on proliferation also um, uh, favors a threshold exposure. All right, so this is the basis of our clinical trial. So we're administering the drug as a one hour infusion. The idea is to that this threshold um, or this uh, drug infusion schedule should exceed threshold. We're combining it with the 18 FFLT PET imaging to monitor target suppression um, and uh, collecting a whole, whole lot of correlative biology, which I'll talk about in a middle, minute. This is a study in SARC, it's SARC 37. Uh, my co-investigators are Denise Reinke and Rashmi Chug, who helped me from the start with you know, getting this into a, a reasonable trial format and submitting a grant to get it funded. And we have wonderful collaborators like Leo Mascarenas, John Glaude, Mary Francis, Jenna Brigida, and um, Peter Choiki. And these are the sites that it's open. Um, all right, so the study is ongoing, so I'm not really going to discuss the, discuss the results of specific patients, but to say that at the second dose level is where uh, we would predict that we've exceeded the threshold, and all the patients on this uh, um, uh, on, in this cohort um, continued on study after their first disease evaluation. We've accrued rather vigorously since opening in January and should close out the third dose level uh, by the end of this month. Um, as I mentioned, we've loaded this uh, study with correlative biology, consistent with the original vision of, of using the correlative biology to, to focus future discovery efforts. Of course, we have state-of-the-art pharmacokinetic profiling with Doug Figg and Cody Peer at the NCI uh, to really measure whether or not we achieve this threshold. The FLT PET, I'll show you some of that imaging in a second, but it's really proven to be an interesting biomarker that also speaks to drug distribution. We've also correlated uh, um, uh, collaborated with Brian Crompton and Masa Hayashi, world leaders in circulating tumor cells and circulating free tumor DNA, and we are collecting that on all our patients. And we've had a good amount of success at obtaining pre and post treatment uh, biopsies that we will, of course, do RNA sequencing, transcriptome analysis, single cell sequencing, and establish PDX models. As it turns out, the FLT PET does, in fact, suppress in patients. So here's an example of a patient who had a nice response to the to the drug combination. And you can see on the top pre and post treatment, there is some suppression. Um, the actual pedividity of tumors is quite complicated that we've learned with this agent. Um, and so, but, but nonetheless, uh, it's really proven to be an interesting biomarker. And lastly, I do wanna highlight, you know, shortly after the, uh, our publication, Stefan Burdock and Uda, uh, put together a patient cohort where they treated patients with trabectin and rinitecan, and these were the results, and they were published in 2016 in sarcoma. But in these patients, all the patients received trabectin as a three- or a 24-hour infusion, and so that'll certainly help inform the interpretation of the results of this study of whether this one-hour infusion was indeed uh, critical to activity of the drug. So in summary, this is a true bedside to bench and back again approach. Uh, we, you know, we're evaluating trabectin and rinitecan currently in SARC-37. Um, we've described a mechanism where silencing of EWS fly sensitizes to arinotecan, and then arinotecan in turn feeds back to amplify and sustain EWS fly suppression. 
We've shown uh, quite a bit of mechanistic work about how the drug works to suppress EWS fly. Certainly there's a lot more to be learned about this redistribution mechanism, what's driving it, what happens when, this, when the fusion protein gets there. Um, but we have learned that it is schedule dependent. And lastly, you know, the clinical trial design is certainly informed by the preclinical biology. And so it's really exciting. And then hopefully we'll be able to use uh, the patient samples and the biopsies that we obtain to inform future discovery uh, efforts for the entire community. And so just to thank those in my lab who did the work, Alyssa Levine was the one who graphed those beautiful um, uh, preclinical model experiments. And she's just a wonderful uh, lab manager and animal technician and, and really an asset to the lab. Uh, Rebecca Kaufman is our bioinformatics person. Matt Harlow was a former PhD and former Dana-Farber postdoc who did the majority of the preclinical work. And, and thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Patrick, for this wonderful presentation. I truly believe that while we do need things beyond chemo, I do think chemo is what cures patients and it is with the new technologies that we have and the uh, deep sequencing results, I think we can really learn more about how to use chemo and, and identify new combinations. So I think so, that's very I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, if we can just tune it and make it a little bit better, we can make stepwise gains. And that tuning can be either through smarter combinations and or second generation analogs like Lerbinectin in, in this particular case. Great. So from chemotherapy, we move on now to the T cells that um, Enrica already um, introduced a few minutes ago. So I'd like to ask um, Stefan Bordoff and Uwe Thiel, um, both from Munich. Um, Stefan Bordach is of course very well known. Um, he, he used to be the chief of pediatric um, oncology in München Schwabing, uh, I think until um, spring of this year. And Uwe Thiel, I think is still work, also working in, in Munich and they will, um, introduce uh, engineered T-cell uh, receptor T-cells and what clinical implications um, they may have. And the floor is yours. Stefan, you're, you're Microphone is still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay. And you see my slides? Yes, in presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian, for your introduction. So uh, before I'm going to talk about um, TCR, transgenic T cells, uh, I'd like to applaud uh, Uda and her team, not only for organizing this excellent faculty and great audience, but uh, especially for including uh, patients and parents who gave uh, touching and powerful presentations today. And I think it's one of the most important achievements uh, of the last decade uh, to empower and participate, uh, make it possible that patients and their parents participate. Um, so my first uh, slide is um, getting back to Paul's talk, who uh, did a great job at an ungodly time to remind us that we have to target metastasis uh, with immunotherapy. And uh, the interesting um, finding here is that factors like YB1 that uh, Paul discovered, which are actually inhibiting the primary tumor may favor metastasis. And also um, Olivier, uh, showed this, that in the initiation of uh, metastasis, EWS FLY1 is actually downregulated. And that was also uh, shown by other groups. And that is reminding us of the fact that patients with bone cancer, they do not die of the prim primary tumor, they die of metastasis. 
Uh, and so uh, we started a career lifelong journey to identify targets that drive metastasis and validate them as targets for immunotherapy. And in tumors with low mutational burdens, you have to actually address overexpressed gene products. And as I said, those, ideally those that are required for metastasis. And uh, we have completed the in vivo functional analysis for metastasis of nine of the 37 genes that we found to be overexpressed starting in 2000 and we published this in 2004. And then we generated class one restricted cytotoxic T cells against those products. And eight of the nine targets demonstrated functional relevance for metastasis. And TCRs against eight of the nine targets were cloned in sequence. One target was not immunogenic. And seven of these eight TCRs were cross-reactive, caused fratricide or clonal expansion fail. So that is telling you uh, that uh, I, T cell therapy of metastasis is not a, a weekend fishing trip, it's a career lifelong uh, journey. And since we, we have a symposium 100 years of viewing, um, I just want to point out, I just stuck this slide in when I heard uh, uh, Paul Meyer's talk, um, that we actually, in this publication where we identified the targets, we confirmed James Ewing's dictum that it's an endothelial cell-derived tumor. And that was the publication. Uh, uh, almost two decades ago. And uh, here is the catch of the decade. Chondromodulin 1 is an anti-angiogenic bone protein and a direct downstream target of EWS SLI1. And it's specifically expressed in Ewing sarcoma, as you see here, as compared to normal, including fetal tissue. And it, it's a direct downstream target, as said, and it mediates metastasis. As you see here on the right panel, uh, the inactivation of uh, chondromodulin 1 leads to a in vivo dose-dependent uh, reduction of metastasis. And uh, so if you um, want to apply these T cells in the clinic, you have to assess cross-reactivity of the T cell receptor. And the gold standard here is the amino acid exchange. And you see here that between 40% and 70% uh, of the amino acids in the targeted peptides are replaceable. That's the case for steep one and papalysin, two targets that were mentioned in the talk, uh, uh, to, in various talks today by Katya and also by Thomas that was discovered by Thomas. Um, but if you look at the homologous peptides that are really expressed and are existing, then you see that uh, in the case of papalysin and chondromodulin 1, these um, peptides, these promiscuous peptides, they don't really exist. And for chondromodulin 1, you can really see these uh, little gray bars here. Only 38 such peptides exist in nature. And of course, we looked at the 38 and we found um, that um, there was four of these 38s uh, that displayed a sufficient binding score uh, to be recognized by T cells and the best being a mitochondrial transporter MCUB, which uh, turns out to be different just by one methyl group uh, from chondromodulin 1. And this single acid, um, amino acid exchange leads to a decrease, as you see here by the hatch bars compared to the white bars, decreased um, peptide uh, binding uh, and TCR recognition. However, the, this peptide, the MCUB peptide, is not 
uh, being processed and not being presented. And that is why no cross-reactivity occurs. And the receptor affinity half-life turned out to be about uh, two minutes. So um, I'm, I'm gonna address now in the next three minutes, uh, three optimizations uh, of, the, of this therapy. And the first is addressing uh, the stroma and the microenvironment as pointed out by Enrique and uh, Pat already, uh, showing that this uh, paradoxon in Ewing's sarcoma of inflammation and immunosuppression, as Enrique said, it's an immune desert, although it's an inflammatory tumor with uh, inflammation signs, and fever. And that is, uh, as um, Hendrik and Valentina uh, showed out, linked to expression of endogenous retroviral elements uh, in, uh, in particular myeloid cells that turn out to be immunosuppressive. These are mainly expressed, these retro elements in DNR negative myeloid cells, and these are uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So that may be one mechanism why uh, this tumor uh, has an immune desert around to protect them. And the optimization two addresses this problem, and this is work by Sebastian Schober in the lab, uh, by um, using a genetically engineered, actually driven by the metastatic driver YB1 uh, mentioned earlier, discovered by Paul. And this activation uh, of this oncolytic virus uh, induces immunogenic cell deaths, generating a hot and pro-immunogenic environment. And you actually see here in this green curve that the combination of our T cell with this oncolytic virus uh, increases a better lysis of the tumor cells as compared to the T cell alone. And uh, of course, as compared to also the oncolytic virus alone, and that's the control group. So the YB1 driven oncolytic adenovirus mediated immunogenic cell deaths may be a, a means to overcome the extracellular vesicle, the exosome containing retro element uh, derived immune suppression. And the optimization three, and, and Uwe will, uh, um, will this explain this in further detail, uh, addresses uh, to increase the functionality by autotopic TCR replacement instead of random TC, uh, TCR replacement done by a doctor student in, the, in our lab, Bu Sheng Yu, who actually shows that you can generate by CRISPR-Cas gene editing, knocking out the endogenous alpha chain and replacing this with the therapeutic product. You can generate a very pure T cell population that is functional, as you see here, um, especially in long-term culture. So in, in short-term culture, uh, these uh, CRISPR-Cas engineered T cells that you see here in red are not necessarily better than the retrovirally transduced, but after 54 days, there is clearly an improvement. And you see this also by um, a, a Cleve Barb as an indicator of apoptosis. And you see that these T cells kill specifically the peptide presented by T2 cells or by A2, but not positive, but not by A2 negative uh, cancer cells, uh, Ewing sarcoma cells. And that's the quantitative evaluation. And there's a, a last improvement that we recently discovered and uh, published. So this is in the December issue of Blood. Uh, where we showed that uh, BALL is actually driven by a tumor suppressor gene. So this Mondo A 
is necessary, necessary, necessary for malignancy of B cells because it maintains the aggressiveness uh, and the leukemic burden in ALL by modulating metabolic stress response. And that refers to what Paul was just saying, that tumor cells need a mechanism to limit oxidative stress. And Mondo A does this not only in leukemic uh, lymphoid cells, but also as has been recently shared uh, with us by Crystal McCall and Steve Grubb, also in therapeutic T cells. And that's another mean to uh, prevent tonic signaling and uh, improve the, uh, prevent also activation use cell deaths and improve the efficacy. So to summarize the first part, uh, we need immunotherapy to address metastasis uh, over um, estimation uh, of cross-reactivity may occur by just looking at amino acid exchange assay and these T cells, as Uwe will show you, uh, may prolong survival and the extracellular vesicle or exosome derived retro elements may be a key to understand the oxymoron of inflammation and immunosuppression in cancer. And the, these T cells synergize with YB1 driven oncolytic virus and the autotopic uh, TCR gene delivery may improve this safety and functionality. And uh, last but not least, understanding immunometabolism, not only in the tumor, but also in the therapeutic T cell population may help to prevent tonic signaling and T cell exhaustion. And with that, I uh, uh, head over to Uwe, who will address the clinical application. Thank you for your attention. Hold on, I'll be right there. Can you see my screen? We do. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for the introduction into the clinical part. Thank you also to Uta Dixon and the organizing committee. I feel quite honored to have the possibility to talk here. Um, I will give, uh, sorry, an overview on uh, the clinical application, but I'll give some information about our preclinical um, uh, studies that we're working on at the moment. So this is basically the method that we're using, uh, that ha we have been using so far to identify uh, targets on using sarcoma in an HLA2 context. So we load dendritic cells that are HLA2 positive we co-culture them with T cells, CDA positive T cells, and we see the expansion of the C T cells. We can isolate these T cells then and uh, co-culture them with tumor cells, also in an HLA2 context, and these T tumor cells could get recognized and killed. And if that was the case, we uh, cloned the TCR and we used retroviruses to, um, to transduce donor T cells and to um, generate large numbers of T cells here with a very, uh, well, naive phenotype. That was, um, that was what we did in the past. Um, now the problem is, of course, if you use a retroviral insertion, you have random insertion to the genome. You never know if you have um, the T cell receptor that will maybe pair with the endogenous T cell receptor. There are techniques to sort of get rid of the endogenous T cell receptor. But anyways, it's a little bit um, uh, difficult to always reproduce the same T cell using this method. Anyways, we showed, uh, we saw in preclinical um, models were using humanized mice, um, which I will show here, and we saw tumor regression. And we went even so far that we treated patients, four patients um, uh, with, uh, well, end stage Ewing sarcoma. This is one of them using T cells uh, transgenic against um, or specific against uh, Ewing sarcoma. And uh, this was one patient who relapsed after allogeneic stem cell transplantation with Ewing sarcoma. This patient had a multifocal uh, relapse and we implemented uh, T cells generated in our lab 
and we um, gave them to this patient. And this is uh, the PET signal after the first transfer. And this is the PET signal after the second transfer. So we saw some kind of weakening of the PET signal. And we deduced that this could be associated with some kind of anti-tumor response. We could also detect our T cells in um, the patient's blood and in the bone marrow. And we saw homing of our T cells to affected bone marrow sites. This has been uh, published in 2017. And, um, but anyways, this is just a hospital ex exemption. We cannot really deduce that much information out of this. So we always wanted to plan some kind of clinical study in order to really um, draw um, uh, information that are uh, more uh, profound on, on this issue. Anyways, we gave 20 million T cells to this patient and there was no sign of GVHD. So at least we saw no toxicity or very, very, very uh, little toxicity in one patient. And uh, this was already some kind of information. But anyway, we would have liked to start a clinical study and um, if you want to start a clinical study, I think everybody who's dealing with clinical studies know about the regulatory problems, about the whole issue, that the, the, the money that and the time that you have to put into it. So we decided to use a technique in which we don't have to use viral transfer because this is a, well, difficult uh, issue uh, from regulatory uh, point of view. And we also saw that using electroporation and orthotopic replacement, replacement of the T cell receptor and to put it under the control of the physiological promoter may even lead to better viability and better anti-tumor uh, responses. This has been published by a group here in Munich, not against, uh, this was more in the infectional, um, infection setting. But anyways, we, we sent um, Usheng and uh, Christina uh, from our team to their lab and they sort of transferred the technology using CRISPR-Cas for T cell receptor transduction. So this is basically the technique. I think everybody is aware of what we're dealing with. So we can really put our gene product at a particular site. And here we cut out the uh, endogenous T cell receptor and put our T cell receptor into uh, the genome um, to put it right under the uh, control of the respective promoter. These are some uh, preliminary results that we see as Stefan uh, already uh, showed as well. Um, we saw that the transduction rates of um, uh, CRISPR-Cas transduced T cells are comparable to the retroviral um, tra transduction, but this does not really say anything about the quality of the T cells because you have to check for uh, recognition and killing. Here we saw recognition of the tumor cells uh, in both and CRISPR-Cas and retro element, a uh, retro, retrovirus setting. Um, we saw also the killing in the, um, in the exelligence setting. So uh, the HOA2 positive T, uh, Ewing sarcoma cell lines got killed, whereas uh, the controls did not. But this still is not really um, a quality uh, proof because uh, the longer longevity is more important. So do they work on a long-term? Can we find them uh, after, well, two months, for, for example, can we find our T cells? And uh, I think we have to do some preclinical pre um, uh, research on this before we can enter into the clinical uh, situation of using a, well, a phase one, phase two clinical trial. Anyways, we have to work on this. We have to prepare a, a clinical trial. So I'll give some information about what we're heading for. This is a Gantt chart, um, quite um, well, a time plan um, normally uh, just to give an overview. So we have to generate the T cells under uh, GMP conditions this is already quite a problem, but this is feasible. We, can, we have a GMP facility here in Munich and um, we have a cooperation going on. So we have to take a look at eff efficacy and toxicity we have to uh, uh, identify the eligibility criteria, for example, just to treat refractory Ewing sarcoma patients that are not uh, enrolled in any other study anymore. And of course, the endpoints, and the, the, uh, we also thought about TCR transgenic T cell labeling, but this is just an idea. And uh, we're trying to, well, identify uh, the work plan. Okay. Um, 
So this could be, for example, the inclusion criteria of uh, a clinical phase one trial. As I said, refractory disease and uh, current disease state for which uh, there is no curative therapy anymore. And of course, uh, people and patients have to agree and have to be uh, have to get the right information on what we're actually doing. So this could be a trial flow. For example, we uh, uh, check for eligibility, we uh, get informed consult, consent, and we maybe get an enrollment. This is a classical three by three uh, trial design. But we would start, for example, with uh, 100,000 uh, T cells per kilogram body weight in combination with um, dendritic cells that are pulsed with the peptide. And if we see uh, dose limiting uh, toxicity, we would just stop here. But if we do not see this, and this is quite probable, as we saw in uh, the last uh, slide, um, slides before in the clinical setting, um, we would start with the next dose for the next three patients. Of, uh, um, and as soon as we get any toxicity, we would stop. And we would go on further to uh, uh, 10 million per kilograms. And then we could even uh, um, uh, combine this therapy with the checkpoint inhibitor which uh, we all already did, and um, I think two out of four patients. So uh, I'm already, already at the end. Um, the future perspectives would be to compare the retroviral versus non-viral transduction uh, techniques. This would be important. Um, if they are equal, then we could maybe use the non-viral transduction protocols we already saw that uh, we can generate a, a, a very similar phenotype in both protocols. So we can clearly um, uh, compare these uh, two um, techniques. Uh, we have to identify new tumor-associated antigens, maybe also um, expressed on other cancer entities. Um, we would like to uh, use uh, um, uh, dendritic cells that are loaded with a peptide. And of course, we have to check on the preclinical pre toxicity using humanized mice, we use a mouse system where we transplant the mice with the human, um, human immune system. And of course, we have to raise funding and cl for clinical uh, phase one trial design. So um, just briefly, our cooperation partners- I think we, um, Uwe, I'm, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you because I'm we have we are kind of nine minutes over time. I know. And everyone will recognize those, those slides. And I'm sorry to, that I need to interrupt, but we need to go on. Because no I'm at the end already. <laughs> no, I'm, I know it's kind of impolite, but no, no, um, okay. check my apologies. We're at 10, 10 minutes over time for this Good. presentation. Okay, so we'll move on, move to the next speaker, uh, which is Claudia Rössig. She is the uh, chief of the Department of Pediatric um, Oncology in Münster, and she shifts from, uh, from the um, topic of dendritic cell-based T-cell therapy to a specific target, the GD2 CAR T-cells, which she is spearheading in a clinical trial. And she will update us on, on her like st state of the research of the trial. Claudia. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I had some trouble sharing my slides, so I'm opening again. Oh yeah, did you send them to, ah, okay, now it's working. Yeah, here they are. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce CAR T cells into this meeting. We will stay with T cell therapy and I completely agree with Uwe and Stefan that T cell therapy in principle is a very good idea um, in Ewing sarcoma since they act by an entirely different mechanism than classical cytotoxic agents and even molecularly targeted agents and could just be a very good strategy to complement traditional treatment. So um, the principle of CAR T cells, just to briefly recapitulate, is slightly different to TCR-based um, engineering because um, CAR T cells interact not with peptide MHC, but instead with tumor-associated surface antigens. And that is achieved by engineering T cells to express these so-called CARs that consist of an extracellular binding domain derived from an antibody 
and linked to intracellular co-stimulatory components and signaling um, elements. So a T cell that engages tumor associated antigen will receive an activation stimulus, will delete the tumor cell and expand in vivo and ideally persist as memory T cell. Here you see an example how in a single dose of CAR T cells achieved a complete remission in this patient with a large mass. This mass was not Ewing sarcoma. It was an extra medullary manifestation of B cell precursor ALL. It was a CD19 specific T cell. And it just demonstrates what these T cells can do. But in true solid tumors, CAR T cell therapy so far have not been truly effective. And that is despite the fact that CAR T cell therapy did not start off with B cell malignancies in CD19, but the first clinical trials performed were in solid tumors. And this is one that I did myself together with Malcolm Brenner when I was a postdoc in his institution in Houston. We generated one of the first um, CARs this time against neuroblastoma and against an antigen that is not a protein antigen, so no transcript. It's a ganglioside glycosphingolipid anchored in the plasma membrane, and it's called GD2. GD2 is expressed in immature neural precursors, also in mesenchymal precursors. And the disease we targeted, neuroblastoma, as a derivative from neuroectodermal tissue, highly expresses GD2 on the cell surface. Our study results still were only moderately successful. None of these responses was durable. More recently, there has been light on the horizon, at least in neuroblastoma. Here you see results from a clinical trial performed in the UK, also targeting GD2 in neuroblastoma. And here at the highest dose level with an advanced CAR T cell design and some improvements included into the study like preparative lymphodepleting chemotherapy. There were some mixed responses and even good partial responses observed. He was the best response. So this patient um, had bone marrow disease almost entirely cleared by a single dose of CAR T cells. This was also reflected by a very good partial remission in this MIBG scan. So CAR T cells can be active. And the good news here also was that they did not cause any CNS toxicity, even though GD2 is known to be expressed low level also in the CNS. So that was a major fear. So how can we move CAR T cell therapy to Ewing sarcoma? We investigated GD2 as a target also in Ewing sarcoma, since um, generally Ewing sarcoma is thought to be derived from a mesenchymal progenitor cell. I know Stefan Bordak disagrees, but um, this is not um, the current focus, actually. It just um, motivated us um, since mesenchymal progenitor cells were also described to express GD2 to investigate this target in Ewing sarcoma. We developed technologies to, de to um, detect GD2 reliably by immunohistochemistry and also immunofluorescence staining, not only in paraffin embedded tissues, but also in cryopreserved tissues. And we found GD2 at at least moderate density in about 40 to 50, no, um, 50 to 60 percent of biopsies um, tested. And this corresponds to findings by flow cytometry in cell lines. In the individual patient, GD2 expression is consistent at diagnose and relapse. And some patients can express GD2 very highly, like in this example, looking like a neuroblastoma. However, density was variable among patients. Some express it only at moderate or low densities, like in this center example. And that would probably mean that expression is too low to trigger the CAR and activate the T cell. And then GD2 expression can also be heterogeneous. So some cells express it, others do not. And that will certainly cause antigen negative escape. So at the moment, all we can do is stratify our patients for GD2 targeted therapy, treating only or including into studies only the ones that express it. That doesn't help the ones that express it at low densities or not at all. 
So we were looking at ways to upregulate GD2 in um, Ewing sarcomas. And we hypothesized that epigenetic agents could be a good means to do so. We focused on histone methyltransferase EZH2, which is um, the um, enzymatic component of the polychrome repressor complex 2. Um, EZH2 silences genes involved in cell differentiation and in Ewing sarcomas was found to have a central role in maintaining self-renewal and tumorigenicity. So um, what you see here are nine Ewing sarcoma cell lines. I showed you before that of 19 cell lines, 10 are GD2 positive. These are the nine GD2 negative ones. We treated them with an EZH2 inhibitor, GSK126, for one to two weeks. And we found that the agent upregulated GD2 in seven of these nine cell lines. This was reversible upon removal of the agent. It was reproducible with tazemetostat, an alternative already approved agent. And um, if we treated alternative, healthy, normal cells, or other cell lines from different cancers, from alternative cancers, we did not see any GD2 upregulation, which um, supports the concept. So how about um, in vivo data? We also used tazemetostat, the clinically approved agent, to treat mice with um, CHLA10 Ewing sarcoma xenografts. We treated them for two weeks and then performed an autopsy and stained for GD2 again. And indeed, we found that in vivo treatment with tazemetostat reliably upregulates GD2 in Ewing sarcoma. So um, in fact, tazemetostat pretreatment could be an effective window strategy preceding GD2 um, specific CAR T cell therapy to extend the spectrum of this and enhance the proportion of patients amenable to GD2 CAR T cell therapy. But it does not solve um, all of the issues associated with CAR T cell therapy at the moment. Ewing sarcoma, as any solid tumor, is embedded into a tumor microenvironment that contains various highly hostile components against infiltrating T cells. In fact, Ewing sarcomas, as other childhood cancers and other sarcomas, is a prototype of an immune desert, um, a kind of tumor that does not respond to checkpoint inhibition that has various stroma and cellular components that exclude T cells from the tumor microenvironment and that induce dysfunction, exhaustion, and even T cell death. And one candidate cell component that is um, substantially enriched in the tumor microenvironment in Ewing sarcoma is a tumor associated macrophage and other myeloid cell components. So we investigated in an explorative design, investigated Ewing sarcomas by multicolor immunohistochemistry, looking at the cellular components, several candidate components. We found indeed that there were essentially no T cells, but a large number of macrophages. We found by looking at various immunosuppressive candidates that these infiltrating macrophages can express the immune inhibitory component HLA-G, and we found that this was associated with a number of infiltrating macrophages. And then when we expressed HLA-G in a myeloid cell line and exposed them to CAR T cells, we found that indeed these HLA-G positive myeloid cell inhibited the function of CAR T cells in in vitro assays. So this is one mechanism of likely very many, and we are fully aware that by simply inhibiting one mechanism, we will not be able to make CAR T cells work. There are too many cooperating uh, mechanisms um, active. So what we are focusing on is a strategy that um, relies on engineering T cells, not only with a chimeric antigen receptor, but in addition with a functional enhancer that is triggered only upon interaction of the car with the target. And this enhancer can be cytokine IL-12, IL-18, like in the study we are currently planning. It can also be a single chain antagonist of some inhibitory principle 
or it could be an alternative strategy, some anti-Ewing sarcoma agent. We engineered in cooperation with Henrich Abken in uh, Regensburg and um, Axel Schambach in Hanover as a one vector that is able to express both transgenes in one um, vector and um, effectively transduce T cells. And we are now pursuing a clinical trial with the first of this, what we call CAR-T micropharmacies. And that will be a German multi-center trial um, in, with centers also in Essen and in Münster and several others. But there is one issue left. Um, even uh, just imagine CAR-T cell therapy is effective. And we want to treat patients uh, large scale within clinical studies and even outside clinical studies. We will need access to CAR-T cell products. And CAR-T cell products are very expensive to manufacture and they actually remain so even after effective development. So for, for a pharmaceutical company, it is entirely unattractive to develop such products for a rare disease. And we cannot expect um, and count on pharmaceutical industry to um, help us develop such products for broader clinical use in a rare indication like Ewing sarcoma. So what we are pursuing in parallel is to set up academic manufacturing. A model that I have in mind is that certain academic sites um, uh, it, um, obtain GMP licenses for individual products. And we have semi-automated technologies now that allow us to do so. And then these sites can distribute these products to additional sites that do not have licenses, but are eager to enroll patients into such studies or simply eager to treat um, patients uh, once such agents have been approved. So um, to sum up, CAR T cell therapy does have potential also in solid cancers, but to become effective against Ewing sarcomas, it will certainly need further advances. One issue is that CAR targets are all flawed by heterogeneous expression and GD2 is no exception. One um, option could be to selectively upregulate the antigen by epigenetic agents in a window preceding CAR T cell therapy. In addition, we have to um, ad address barriers in the tumor microenvironment. We have to generate higher performance CAR T cells or combine them in a smart way with um, combination partners. And then I just um, would like to, uh, you to bear in mind that this um, current approval of CAR T cells as standard medicinal agent will not allow us to use them in a broad way, even if we manage to um, achieve a success with clinical studies. So we will have to think of ways um, to manufacture them. And with this, all I have to do is acknowledge my group in Münster and our cooperation partners. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Claudia, for um, being even a little bit ahead of time. So this actually allows us, there are, two, there are a couple of questions in the chat. One uh, was by Roberto Lux, who was, who was saying that in neuroblastoma, he was um, observing that in, in the relapse setting, the GD2 positivity was going down. Is that something that you've seen in relapsed Ewing sarcomas? That's question one. And one other question by Jeff Turetsky was, if there was an intervention with an easy H2 inhibitor, um, how long would that increased in, in expression last? Is that something that stays or would you have to do repetitive treatments? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question with the stability of GD2, in neuroblastoma, actually, there are some rare instances where GD2 is entirely lost or going down really strongly, but it's rare exceptions. Um, GD2 in neuroblastoma really is a good target and it's not as good in uh, Ewing sarcoma. In those patients where we did repetitive um, investigations of GD2 expression at diagnosis and relapse, even several relapses, we did find it to be stable in uh, in several patients, not in all, but typically it was um, stably expressed. And we did find it even at a higher rate at relapse than at primary at first disease, which is always a good thing, um, of course, because it doesn't look like it's being lost at relapse so easily. 
And your second question, for how long upregulation lasts, um, we only have in vitro experiments um, for that. And it does start going up um, after a week of continuous treatment and reaches um, a peak after two weeks and then lasts for another two weeks, even upon removal, and then goes down again. So there will be some opportunity for GD2 targeting. All right. Thanks a lot, and good luck for the trial. We're all looking forward to the results of that. <laughs> Thank and you. Last, second last uh, presentation is by Jeff, uh, Jeff Turetsky, who everyone has, has seen today already. He's a chief of pediatric oncology at Georgetown University in Washington. And there's also Stefan Zollner who presented already and Joseph Ludwig from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. You have the conundrum of um, sharing 15 minutes with three people. And we're looking forward to the presentation on the low, seemingly lowest hanging fruit targeting uh, the, the fusion protein. Well, thank you, Sebastian, and, and thank you, Uta, and um, everyone for uh, setting up, who set up this wonderful day and uh, for giving us the opportunity. Um, Stefan Zellner uh, actually excused himself so that we now only have two people uh, presenting today, and it'll make it a little bit better. And I'm going to go really quickly to try to do my part in seven to eight minutes so that Joe has time for his, and maybe we have time for a question. Um, and here we go. Hold on to your hat. First of all, I have to disclose that we are going to talk about molecules that, because I'm a co-founder of the company, consultant, and hold equity, I have to disclose this. Okay. So this is a graph you've seen a few times today, and I really want to just emphasize how, with metastatic patients, we haven't made a lot of progress. With localized patients, we still could have a long ways to go. And um, this was apparent to me um, 25 to 28 years ago when I started studying Ewing sarcoma, and um, the need for an EWS fly inhibitor um, was is sort of, as you say, low-hanging fruit. Like, why can't we inhibit this critical um, protein? Well, it turns out targeting proteins was something back in the 90s was actually thought of as impossible for anything. And along came Brian Drucker, who was able to create um, the first uh, directed inhibitor against BCR able. And um, the, the kinase essentially then became the low-hanging fruit for inhibition. And the transcription factor became what was called the undruggable protein, because transcription factors, for the most part, didn't have any of the biophysical characteristics of a kinase that you could simply pop a drug into a specific slot and um, have it inhibit. So we really had an interesting challenge when we started to think about this problem, um, which is something that Aikut Iran and I took on about 21 years ago. We decided that um, without going through the long list of things I would give in a longer talk, we decided to go after the proteins that interact with EWS fly. And the idea that we had was um, up until this point, many people had discovered that specific proteins um, are interacting with EWS fly and they're, they're across the map in different ways. And nobody really knew how they were specifically interacting, but many studies, um, including some uh, presented, um, published by Heinrich Kovar, who was speaking earlier today, um, showed that these different proteins, basically unrelated to each other, were involved in direct interaction with EWS fly, and in some cases, directly involved with regulating some of the transcriptional targets. So we had this interesting hypothesis that if we could um, learn about these protein interactions and identify some of the specific proteins, and one of them we found early was RHA, which was even shown earlier, um, we, um, the idea would be that if we could create something that would stick to EWS fly um, and block the interaction of some critical protein, such as RHA, that we would then be able to have a, um, a therapeutically uh, targeted drug that would have relative specific specificity for EWS fly. Okay, so in order to do that, um, we did a series of experiments um, with phage display and the phage display gave us a peptide and the peptide led us to the RHA. And uh, Thomas Grunewald showed that work a little bit this morning. Um, and 
It turns out that we took advantage of that by creating a GST RHA fusion of the part of RHA from 630 to 1020 amino acid that binds to EWS fly. We knew exactly where EWS fly was binding to RHA, but we didn't know where RHA was binding to EWS fly. And we wanted to validate whether we could actually disrupt the interaction. And the way we did it was with a competitive peptide. So this shows the amino precipitation of the interaction. And this shows when we add in the peptide, we can dissociate the two and that effect is dose titratable. Now showing that we could break RHA from EWS fly was only part one. The second thing we had to show was that breaking RHA from EWS fly would have an adverse effect on tumorigenesis. And we did that here by taking that same peptide, putting a GFP tag on it and showing that when it was expressed, the, the, the peptide was expressed throughout Ewing's sarcoma, as opposed to just the GFP alone, we could suppress colony formation. When that peptide was excluded from the nucleus using a nuclear export signal, we could show that uh, there was no effect on colony formation. And we put that same peptide into rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and neuroblastoma, neither of which have the fusion. And we showed that there was no effect on um, oncogenic soft agar colonies. Okay, so then we had to go from there uh, to a small molecule because peptides just weren't gonna make it as prime time drugs. So the idea was the same. Could we put a small molecule on the EWS fly and block RNA helicase? We used the technique called surface plasmon resonance, where we would attach EWS fly onto the surface of a chip. And once that EWS fly was bound, you would simply see that there would be a deflection of light. This was measured by the computer. And then one by one, we ran small molecules over the um, bound EWS fly. And we simply looked for a small molecule that would stick to EWS fly. And that was gonna be a proof of principle that we could even do it. So the, you know, at the time it was called undruggable. Nobody thought we could even stick a molecule on the EWS fly, but we actually did and we found one. And the one that we found um, was from a National Cancer Institute library of compounds that went by this name and number. This is the structure of that compound. And um, with some chemistry, Yali Kong um, at Georgetown University um, in her fourth notebook on page 279, did a series of analogs around this phenyl ring, including this methoxy. And then um, one of the things we were able to do is since we didn't know exactly where this molecule was binding the EWS fly, we were able to separate this into its two enantiomers. And we showed in a whole series of assays that are published that I won't be able to go into it today, that only the S enantiomer was active at inhibiting EWS fly, including this biochemical assay using full length recombinant RHA, which is published in this nucleic acid research paper. Going on. So now we had to find out whether or not this drug would really work. So the drug was a pharmacologic nightmare. Eventually, Peter Houghton suggested we create the first Ewing sarcoma model in a nude rat, which is what you're seeing here. And the nice thing about the nude rat was able to give the drug by continuous infusion. So we gave the drug by continuous fusion, and lo and behold, over about a three-week period of time, we not only caused complete regression of fairly large tumors, but when we looked at the pathology, we could see elimination of CD99 positive cells in the leg where the tumor was growing. So we were pretty encouraged by this. This led us um, to go on. I just wanna briefly show because the um, talk was advertised with Kristen, work with Stefan Zellner and when he was in my group, um, showed that there was synergy between Vincristin and YK, which was part of the clinical trial, but we won't have much more time for that today. And anyway, we went on to try to create a company. I tried twice because the patients wanted this drug and they failed. Finally, Scott Glenn got in touch with me about a different project and we formed a company called Tocalus in 2014. That led to the uh, analog TK216, which had the same activity as the SYK4279. So that's where the clinical trial continued. Um, we got the IND in 2016. And uh, in order to stay on time, these are the people that made that happen. Aikut Oren was a partner in this um, since the beginning, and I give him a tremendous amount of credit for helping me stay focused and on task. Um, Steve Metallo um, is a chemist here at Georgetown who was really helpful in helping us work with the disordered protein. And there were many foundations along the way that helped us with the support. And uh, now I would like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague down in Houston, Texas, Dr. Joe Ludwig, to tell you all about the clinical trial and the results. Take it away, Joe. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Jeff. And uh, thank you, uh, Uda and, and the audience for the invitation today. It's certainly a pleasure to present in front of this esteemed audience. 
sorry if I'm losing my voice a little bit, uh, a little bit under the weather, but uh, so this was a trial, obviously based on a immense amount of work uh, preclinically by uh, Jeff. Uh, I wanna just acknowledge the group uh, nationwide that participated in this trial. It uh, enrolled uh, nine different institutions spread geographically throughout the United States. So the design itself had two phases and each phase had two parts. Uh, phase one B was a dose escalation component. We started at a dose at 18 milligrams per meter squared per day. And I should note, this is an IV formulation. There was a discussion about whether or not patients could, uh, could whether or not we could actually develop the oral formulation soon enough or whether or not we should just directly try the proof of concept and provide this intravenously. So the decision to start was intravenous. We started a dose of 18 milligrams per meter squared, gradually increased that up to a dose limiting toxicity, which was observed at 288 milligrams per meter squared per day over a seven day infusion. Subsequently we dropped the dose down to 220 milligrams over that seven day period that was well tolerated and then eventually extended that from seven days to 10 days. During the 10 day infusion, there was a DLT and subsequently we dropped the dose to 200 milligrams per meter squared per day over that 10 day period. That was well tolerated both for the 10 day dose as well as a 14 day dose. Um, at that therapeutic level, we were achieving what we thought based on pharmacokinetics, a uh, super therapeutic dose. Um, as Jeff alluded to, but we don't have an extensive amount of time to discuss today, there was strong data that this would be synergistic with Encristin. And so the decision in the expansion portion of the trial in the phase two was to combine TK216 with Encristin. So that was studied in 44 patients. Ultimately, we presented that data to the FDA. And I'll talk about response data shortly, but what you're seeing is that effectively, uh, we had a disease control rate of about 44%, a response rate of about 8.1%, and the FDA did not feel that that was necessarily going to push that into the end zone for FDA approval. Subsequently, based on their advice, we reduced uh, or eliminated the vincristin, and now all patients in the current cohort are receiving a slightly lower dose of 175 milligrams per meter squared per day, now continuously over a 28-day period. The rationale behind that was based on Jeff's uh, preclinical work where this drug potentially had a cytostatic activity, and he was seeing that you were seeing a stair-stepping approach. On drug, it appeared to delay the growth of the tumor. Off drug, uh, to avoid toxicity, tumors were growing. And the thought was that if this was potentially working as a cytostatic drug, that continuous infusion would uh, enhance efficacy. So um, across the board, when you look at both at all subjects and patients treated in cohort nine, uh, sorry, go back one if you would. So we're seeing an overall response rate of 8.1%, three patients uh, out of uh, 37 that we believe are at a therapeutic dose in cohort nine in the expansion cohort, one partial response and a disease control rate of 40.5%. When you look at uh, the swimmer's plot, uh, interestingly enough, and I'll show you data both on a patient from Paul Myers and a patient from MD Anderson, those patients that responded, I would note, respond very quickly. And I'll briefly talk about Paul's patient, but his patient responded really within the first two cycles. I would note that that was a response purely with the TK216 prior to administration of Encristin. Patient by Dr. Ravine Rutan here also responded very quickly. Um, what you'll also see is, of course, that many patients don't respond. And so that raises uh, some of the questions that are raised in the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll present uh, two patients and I really wanna reserve the last three or four minutes to open the field for questions um, about what we think might be going on with the drug, potential mechanism to resistance and potentially the path forward. So this was a patient by Paul Myers. It was a 19 year old male. I won't go through all of the background on this but I would just say that this patient had uh, been extensively treated with a VDC IE based chemotherapy regimen. This patient was translocation positive and had a very dramatic response within the first two cycles. Ultimately, the patient had one area that was a non-target lesion that was resected. And this patient has been on drug in a CR state for more than two years. Next patient, or next slide, please. 
So this was a patient by Dr. Rattan. This was uh, a renal Ewing's translocation positive, also received BDCIE. This patient had uh, relapse after about one and a half years, uh, numerous uh, multiple uh, lesions progressing within the lung. And he achieved also a very fast response within the first few cycles of treatment. Ultimately, he had a CR after six cycles of chemotherapy and currently is uh, approximately 22 months on this drug, receiving both uh, TK216 initially of Incristin for the last year. He's effectively been on single agent TK216. Well tolerated. And uh, we have the unusual scenario when you have these two patients about whether or not you would ever take them off drug. We really obviously haven't been in a scenario where we see patients respond for this kind of duration. And that brings up the next slide about really where we are with this trial, where do we think we can go? So this was the first human study targeting the ETS gene in Ewing sarcoma. The phase one portion of the study is complete. We've defined a recommended phase two dose. And we're currently in the final cohort where we're using a lower dose continuous infusion of TK216 to see if we can enhance the efficacy seen in some of the later cohorts. The drug is relatively safe. Uh, the, the dose limiting toxicity is neutropenia and uh, uh, myelosuppression with some element of thrombocytopenia. Uh, next slide. So this really raises the final slide that I'd wanna go into today uh, slowly for maybe the next two or three minutes. And I think the elephant in the room, both in uh, presentations presented by Dr. Rattan at CTOS recently and uh, by myself at other forums was uh, why not everyone with Ewing sarcoma responds to this drug. Clearly, Jeff developed some very strong data suggesting that this drug does bind to ETS genes. It does displace RNA helicase A. And yet, given the fact that this is a pathognomonic target in all patients with Ewing sarcoma, one would have anticipated a higher proportion of patients responding to this therapy. And so that raises the question, are there something about the tumors themselves that change how this drug uh, behaves? Is there a variation in cell of origin? Are there epigenetic effects uh, in uh, these tumors that uh, can invoke resistance? I think that's a question very much uh, open in the air. The other thing is that while clearly based on Jeff's data, the TK216 has an on-target effect of the fusion protein and its interaction with RNA helicase A, I think early on there were some signs that this drug also had potentially off-target effects. And that included data early on from uh, looking at the signature and it was clear that TK216 was not invoking a so-called Ewing's off signature as classically defined by others in this audience, including Kovar, Patrick Rohar, Libby Delatra, and others. And so it wasn't purely acting as an anti-fusion protein targeted drug. The other thing more recently is that uh, there's an article in BioArchive by uh, um, an investigator that suggests that this drug may be having an anti-microtubule um, mechanism. And he did that by looking at hypermutable A673 Ewing cells. He selected those for resistance and was able to find that uh, tumor resistant cell lines had uh, acquired mutations in alpha tubulin, suggesting that at least in part or in addition to its effect on the ETS portion of the fusion protein, TK216 may also be working as an antimicrotubule agent. So that brings together mechanisms of, of adaptation. I have the luxury of kind of listening to many of the talks uh, this afternoon. One could ask if this was truly, or to the extent it was an anti-fusion protein targeted drug, uh, when you look at work by Olivier Delatra, one might suggest that the fusion protein targeted would allow those cells to adapt by changing their actin cytoskeleton and acquiring a more stem cell phenotype. And that raises the question that if you're going to look for synergy with TK216 and other drugs, perhaps you would need to use that drug in combination with drugs that target stimness more generically. The other thing uh, is that uh, work that I didn't have time to go through today from our lab where we had selected cells for resistance to TK216 showed prominent upregulation of markers of stimness, including SNAIL and uh, JAK-STAT in addition to pronounced upregulation of uh, proteins in the IGF-P3 kinase mTOR cascade. 
And so that raises the idea that if you're going to use TK216, what would you combine it with if you're going to try to invoke Synergy? And then finally, in the last minute, I would like to raise just some of the questions about future development. I already mentioned why the drug was initially provided IV, but now that we're in a continuous infusion of the drug, there are obviously logistical concerns with providing this drug as an infusion over a 28 day cycle. Um, one wonders whether or not uh, you'll see an oral formulation of that in the near future. I think honestly, from a corporate perspective and in, in talking with some of their thoughts, they probably need to see more efficacy before spending the dollars to finalize an oral formulation. Um, concurrent, or I would say consistent with many of the speakers today, I think there's a real need to develop response biomarkers of TK216. Uh, there's a possibility that it's, if this drug uh, proceeds forward that one might need to enrich for responders because the all-comer study here probably is not going to make it to the end zone uh, unless you have a higher uh, response rate. And then finally, uh, the last point would just be to bring up the fact that uh, this was an immense amount of work, but as we think about developing drugs in the future, I would encourage, I guess, in the spirit of James Ewing, uh, significant uh, collaboration across labs where one may, for future drugs, think about uh, validating drugs at least in two or more labs and perhaps in 15 or 20 PDX models, not only to look at heterogeneity response, but also to think about developing biomarkers that may allow us as a community to enrich for responders in future trials. So I'll stop there. A wonderful audience, and I, I couldn't be more pleased to join the group today to share my perspective on this clinical trial. Thank you, both of you, for this impressive translational um, work that you've done. We have very little time. There's one question by Stefan Bodach, who was was asking if you can corroborate what Olivier has showed a little earlier that there is fluctuation of the fusion protein in the initiation of metastasis period. So is that something that you have seen in translational studies? I don't know if you have done on treatment studies, if you've done metastasectomy studies that have looked at levels of the fusion yeah, that would be great if we could get the material. I, 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 you know, wish we could get that data, get that material to actually provide the data. We don't have that. It's very hard to get these. As you know, patients aren't really keen to have metastatectomies of Ewing sarcoma once they're in a, a relapsing stage, especially once we know those lesions are all going to be Ewing. So, you know, Stefan, I wish we could get it, but um, it's a, it's a hard thing. I will say that, um, I just want to emphasize, I think the continuous infusion is, is based on what we saw in the animal studies, really going to be key. So we're very optimistic about um, how the uh, longer duration of therapy will go. And I will just comment that um, we do have an NIH grant uh, with Oncturnal to develop an oral formulation. So that's actually going forward. So hopefully we'll be able to have that. And I thank you everybody for the opportunity to be part of this meeting. I think the only thing okay, I want to add to that Jeff, is that, uh, you know, obviously I commend Patrick Rohar and others uh, for kind of sciencing the heck out of uh, their protocol. I mean, that's something that I think clearly going forward, when you come to, the, to this kind of point in the clinical trial, you would have loved to have pharmacodynamic studies uh, where you have pre and post biopsies. Uh, it's obviously a challenge to do, as Jeff mentioned. But, uh, you know, I think one of the unfortunate things is that we really don't have the patient samples from this clinical trial to really answer some of the questions that many in the audience would really want an answer to. I have one very brief question. Is it, 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 have you seen that the inhibitor was acting differently on the endogenous wild type um, EWS? Is that something, I mean, it's not the same protein uh, is it thinkable that there could be an inhibitor that actually makes use of the fact that it that the fusion is different from the actual wild type protein? I'm not sure what you're asking. So the the fusion protein is um, is structurally different because it's a fused protein, right? Okay. From, the, from the, compared to the actual. Um, wild type. Oh, oh, the wild type components that go into the fusion. Yep, because it's, I mean, the fusion protein looks different than the 
EWSR1 itself without the fly one added, right? So Sebastian, it's a really important point. When we decided to do the screening, we realized very early on that the EWS fly fusion was going to have a very different biochemistry than either of the full length wild type fly one full length wild type EWS, which is why we've done all the screening with the full length fusion protein, despite lots of challenges in biochemistry. So that's something that we realized and we were part of the intrinsically disordered protein world um, 12 years ago, because we realized that that was a huge challenge with this protein. So um, yeah, the fusion does and is very different than the wild type component uh, that go into it. Okay. Jeff, what, one thing I might add to that as well, just uh, for a few seconds is that you know, when you think about drug development, a lot of us uh, throughout the day are talking about specific targets for Ewing sarcoma. I would note that in this case, uh, TK216, because it's an ETS targeted protein, theoretically, would also hit the ETS high or ETS positive leukemias, which in part went into the development thought, as well as uh, a sizable fraction of the prostate cancers that have uh, ETS translocation. So as you think about development, I think had it been exclusively a target that was expressed in Ewing sarcoma that would have, I would say, possibly reduced the enthusiasm for developing this kind of agent. And Jeff, you, you may comment on that as well. No, I think we, we need to go yeah. on. So I'll, I'll stop for now and we'll just let everybody go on. It's, other, it's running a little late. Thank you though. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's been super interesting. So final presentation of the day and Emily and Damon, there are still more than 100 um, people in the audience, which still would make a great number if we were at, at an actual meeting. And so Emily, in German, I would pronounce it Tyson. I don't know if you say Thiessen. That's Tyson. correct. We say Tyson. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So Emily is um, working at the Center of Childhood Cancer and Blood Diseases in Columbus, Ohio, where she runs her lab as a PhD, uh, working on chromatin complexes. And Damon Reed uh, works at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And I think he's a um, oncologist, I think. And you will give a nerdy presentation as far as the title goes. I believe so. Can you still hear me? Yes. Can you but see my screen? No, we just see a black screen for the moment. Yeah, it looks like it's still thinking then. So I'll let it. It says double click to change to, I don't know, full screen mode, but. Oh, if I can stop share and start again. It's only on talks outside of the institution does this ever happen. <laughs> oh, there we go. Don't see uh, the screen. So far, so far, there is no screen. Maybe um, I think you have sent the talk also to Michi, so maybe she can uh, she can share, and uh, you just tell her to move. I can share your screen if you want to. Yes, shall we take over, Emily? Yes. I think we have lost her now, actually. <laughs> Emily, are you still here? Maybe Damon can start presenting. Okay, I'll try that out. This is the oh, there are slides. Here we go. Is this your presentation? That's the presentation. That's Emily's now. So maybe we just go out again and Damon takes over. Uh, so Emily's coming I think she's again. Re <laughs> Emily is, is re-entering now. Yes. You tell me what to do. Let's just wait a second. 
until she is with us again. I mean, if possible, it would be good to have Emily's talk first because it was like the story about the development and um makes sense Emily, would you, you Emily, would you like to try again and share yeah. your screen how does that look it yeah. looks better yeah. 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 perfect <laughs> perfect yeah i just moved closer to the router so that ah. might help. <laughs> um okay great so you guys can see the screen and i will go into Presentation mode? Is it in presentation mode? Not, Not yet. yet. Well, for the sake of time, there we go. Great. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today and uh, for your patience in getting the, the slide shared. Um, this has been a, a great collection of talks and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. So I'll talk a little bit about the um, basic side of this project and understanding and targeting LSD1 function in Ewing sarcoma. And I guess I have disclosures now, which is that some of the projects we have going on in the lab do receive funding from Solarius Pharmaceuticals, but none of the data I'm showing today are actually going to, or have actually been funded by Solarius. Um, and so this talk, um, this project really started amidst a wave of interest in targeting the epigenome, and that's because epigenetic complexes contain enzymes that control chromatin structure and function. Um, and this controls gene expression. And in cancer, if you have dysregulation in the epigenome, you can promote the expression of oncogenes and repress the expression of tumor suppressors. And the hope has always been that if you can find the right epigenetic targeted inhibitor for the right complex and the right disease, that this would be beneficial for patients. And so today we're gonna focus on an epigenetic enzyme called lysine-specific demethylase one. This or LSD1. This was the first histone demethylase discovered in 2004. And it's actually a very complicated enzyme. So LSD1 um, is largely dependent upon the complexes upon which it's interacting with. And so um, as an example, the tower domain interacts with um, various proteins that are mutually exclusive, like MTA proteins or CORES proteins. And depending on these proteins, it finds itself um, as a component of either various repressive complexes, this is just a handful of the complexes that have been identified. And when it's in a repressive complex, it typically targets the substrate H3K4, Bono, and dimethyl. For the, um, you can also find LSD1 in activating complexes. And in these complexes, it typically targets the H3K9, Mono, and dimethyl marks. And so um, it also, to add a, a layer of complexity, it, it also has non-histone substrates and so its functional consequences of the LSD1 enzyme activity really depend upon the proteins that it's interacting with, where it ends up in the genome and what its specific substrate there is. Um, and so LSD1 is required for normal development and plays important roles in hematopoiesis, has important functions in stemness and differentiation, um, as well as motility, epithelium, mesenchymal transition, and autophagy amongst many others. And so LSD1 was first recognized as potentially important in Ewing sarcoma by Heinrich's group um, in this publication in 2012, where they identified LSD1 expression in a variety of different sarcomas. And not that long after, um, Steve Lesnick's group identified uh, one of the LSD1 containing complexes, which is the nucleosome remodeling and deacetylase, or NERD complex, as a critical co repressor that was needed for EWS5 mediated transcriptional repression. And here you can see um, EWS fly um, uh, interacts with both CHD4 and MTA2, which are NERD complex components. And when you knock down CHD4, you see nice derepression of EWS fly re repressed targets, LOX and TGF beta R2. So this was kind of exciting because at the same time, um, I was in a different group, an academic drug discovery center at Huntsman Cancer Institute, and we were working on a, a new class of LSD1 inhibitor. And um, this is just two of the representative molecules. This is SP2577, which is now called Cyclodemstat, and our, our real tool compound has been SP2509. And the nice thing about these inhibitors is that they're reversible. And what that means is that instead of binding competitively with the substrate in the substrate binding pocket, it binds somewhere else on the protein, changes the structure of the protein, 
and that in, in the effect kills the enzymatic activity. So you can pick this out um, with a variety of Michaelis Menten assays and we showed really nicely that these are in fact non-competitive inhibitors. So what this means is that not only are, is this class of inhibitors inhibiting the enzymatic activity of LSD1, but it also will block certain protein-protein interactions by altering the structure of LSD1. And so we showed then in this sort of model looking at EWSY repressed targets that there was a, a nice dose-dependent derepression of EWSY repressed targets in the context of these LSD1 inhibitors. Now, this was really exciting. And as we investigated the compounds further, we were surprised to find not only do these compounds derepress EWSY repressed targets, but they also sort of flip the whole signature and, and downregulate EWSY mediated gene activation. And so this um, leads to a model where LSD1 appears to be a critical co regulator of EWSY and that these LSD1 inhibitors somehow break up this critical interaction and disrupt. EWSLI activity. We were also excited to see that uh, when you knock down EWSLI, it caused resistance. And so this suggested to us that expression of the fusion um, was sort of a biomarker for sensitivity to this class of inhibitors, because this was very early days. Um, we la have later have gone on to show that uh, LSD1 in a knockdown itself also causes resistance. And that knockdown of LSD1, um, the transcriptional signature of LSD1 knockdown matches the transcriptional signature of the drug. Um, and so this has been kind of interesting because there are other LSD1 inhibitor classes out there that are irreversible inhibitors that covalently bind in the substrate binding pocket, but don't show any activity against Ewing sarcoma cell lines. And so this has been shown both by our group and others. And this contrasts to um, the, the two inhibitors that we're talking about today here in the, the red and the black. Um, and we also have a negative control compound that we use that has some of the similar um, functional groups that sometimes people get worried about with these compounds. And this, this negative control also shows activity at much, only at much, much higher levels. Um, and we had a, a talented colleague actually showed that this sort of differential class effect for LSD1 inhibitors um, held up a, across Ewing sarcoma cell lines. So this was a panel of 17 cell lines she had curated in the lab. And so um, with this exciting signature, it led to this model where we expect that LSD1 NERD is important for EWSLI mediated repression as, and an unyet no, as an as yet unknown um, complex um, involving LSD1 is important for EWSLI mediated activation. And so we've spent a little bit of time um, and are starting to pivot towards trying to understand this role for LSD1 in EWSLI mediated activation. Um, and first we looked at, does EWSLI expression change LSD1 localization in the genome? And we can see that um, this is a nice example of a locus where there are some locations where LSD1 doesn't bind when EWSLI is expressed, but when you knock it down, that changes and vice versa, places where LSD1 binds when EWSLI is expressed. Um, and then it, it shifts when EWSLI is knocked down. Um, but we also are able to show that LSD1 co-localizes with EWSLI when it is expressed throughout the genome. And this is in four separate cell lines that we've looked at now with cut and run. Um, and you can see here's an example of LSD1 EWSLI co-localization. And when you break it down to the common peaks across all four cell lines, there's a significant overlap between where LSD1 is binding and EWSLI bound peaks. And in any given cell line, you can see that this co-localization happens both at microsatellites and non-microsatellite uh, motifs. And if you look at the genes that are close to some of these motifs, they are EWSLI activated and LSD1 activated, sort of further supporting a role for LSD1 and EWSLI mediated gene activation. Um, we've been able to um, move on and show that EWSLI appears to recruit LSD1 directly through the EWS domain, although this is very preliminary data and these are very hard IPs. Um, and we have further evidence that when you treat with the inhibitor, you're increasing levels of H3 um, canine trimethylation, suggesting that LSD1 is acting in an activating role again. And so a lot of the future work that we're really focusing now is on trying to understand which LSD1 complex is playing a role in gene activation. So we have 
IP mass spec data that's identified three primary complexes for LSD1 in Ewing sarcoma cells. And um, we're trying to understand which of these sit at activated uh, genes and at GGA microsatellites. Um, and then how do the LSD1 complexes contribute to EWCI mediated gene activation? The class difference in the different LSD1 inhibitors really strongly suggests that it's the scaffolding function of LSD1 and it may be some protein that LSD1 is interacting with and the way it's interacting with it that's important. And then how are these LSD1 inhibitors disrupting LSD1 complex composition, localization, and function? Um, and then we have sort of new projects starting up looking at how this biology varies across tumors driven by related EWS infused fusions. Um, and then uh, Damon will talk a little bit more about the clinical development, but we're also interested in translational questions, looking at whether there are additional biomarkers of sensitivity and resistance and um, what likely mechanisms of resistance there are and are there any combination strategies that might prevent this. And so um, the exciting piece of data that really spurred the, the clinical development of this compound that we had early on was um, we saw a really nice efficacy in our xenograft models as a single agent. We were actually able to stop dosing, take mice off and observe them for six months and didn't see any tumor recurrence. With that, I'd like to thank everyone and hopefully I've given Damon enough time to share some updates from the clinical side. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect setup. Thank you, Emily. And so I'm Damon Reed. I'm the principal investigator of the phase one trial. Um, and thank you, Huda. Thank you to the patients that have gone on, the co-investigators and all. Uh, and the sponsors, including Solarius and the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation for this trial. And thank you, Uda, and the organizers for the, uh, the ability to talk briefly about the trial. It is kind of the perfect time to talk about the trial because it really is transitioning from the phase one safety and toxicity portion to a true efficacy phase. So this is the trial of the, at the LSD1 inhibitor SP2577 that Emily just talked about um, called Cyclodemstat. Oh boy, it was very smooth and now I'm not advancing slides. Uh, knew it was too easy. There we go. And so we are, we have completed, this is an oral agent. Uh, it is given twice a day by mouth. Uh, we started with a single tablet, 75 milligrams twice a day and enrolled all the way up through dose level six, uh, 1200 milligrams PO uh, BID, that's 16 tablets uh, twice a day. Um, we have established the recommended phase two dose at 900 milligrams. POTID, so ignore that yellow star. We're, this is the uh, recommended phase two dose. Um, we did single patient um, uh, escalation to start because we knew we were starting at a rather low dose. We had a goal of uh, PK and, and, and because of all the wonderful preclinical data that existed, we, we kind of had a threshold uh, serum concentration that we were trying to get to. And we did see dose dependent increases in AUCs all the way up through that 900 milligrams twice a day uh, recommended phase two dose. Uh, again, some people were treated at a dose above there, and we did not. We we felt like we were nearing saturation of levels, at least based on the AUC in the fasting state. The good news, and uh, we were happy with this recommended phase two dose because at at 600, 900, and 1200 milligrams uh, twice a day, we were having levels sustained for a few hours. This is after a single dose, the first dose on cycle one, day one, of um, levels above that that 1,000 nanograms per milliliter, which again is the active dose and um, a little bit above the active dose and the experiments that Emily was describing, especially the murine experiments. We found uh, that it had a half-life around six hours, um, which was supportive of the oral dosing of the BIT schedule. In terms of toxicity, the dose limiting toxicities were GI in nature. And so we did have some patients with um, early satiety, some hypokinetic and some hyperkinetic uh, GI symptoms like diarrhea um, or vomiting, and others with uh, uh, what felt like bloating. Uh, we did have a single patient with a blood pace increase in par and pancreatitis as well observed, and the GI toxicities were the, the DLTs. There was minimal myelosuppression uh, kind of seen, and that certainly was not dose limiting. Um, based on what we saw as uh, frequent low-grade GI toxicities, we instituted a GI management guideline and found that with pretty quick initiation of uh, antiemetics and other motility pro and anti-motility agents that we were able to treat uh, a little bit more effectively in terms of the GI toxicities. 
In terms of the, uh, like I'm saying, we're pivoting now from that safety dose escalation PK focus by itself um, to uh, combination therapy and uh, searching for an efficacy signal. We did start and enrolled three patients with cyclophosphamide and topotecan with cyclodemstat at uh, 600 milligrams twice a day. That's one below the recommended phase two dose. And currently the study is open for uh, the, at the recommended phase two dose plus topotecan and cyclophosphamide. So there is still a safety lead-in uh, of three to six patients, depending on what we observe in terms of toxicities and then a more formal phase two uh, uh, signal finding uh, plan for Ewing sarcoma uh, patients with the backbone standard agents of cyclophosphamide and topotecan, uh, the chemotherapy backbone that we chose rather than, than arinotecan because of the GI toxicity. So the key inclusion criteria for this ongoing trial are at least one prior line of therapy, but no more than two. Uh, in the phase one, we had very heavily pretreated Ewing sarcoma patients um, no prior therapy with cyclophosphamide and topotecan and measurable disease. The, um, the study is also including, and this was a nice thing that Emily had in her final, uh, one of the bullet points on her final slide was wondering about this activity and other ETS uh, family uh, uh, and fat family uh, uh, protein translocated tumors. And so just to let you know that there is beyond Ewing sarcoma, there is a single agent cyclodem set at that recommended phase two dose that is occurring in myxoid liposarcomas, uh, other sarcomas with EWSR translocation, such as desmoblastic small round cell tumors, and then kind of exploratory with all of the other ones that you know about that have um, that share uh, fusion proteins that we think are drivers and often diagnostic of, of those tumors like sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma and others, uh, where there's not really a lot of models, but we thought we would um, include them in a, a dose finding. Yeah. If, in terms of biology, ctDNA and CTCs are followed on this study and frozen biopsies are being performed in this single agent expansion cohort before and after therapy. The key inclusion criteria for these non-Ewing sarcomas are at least one, but no more than three prior lines of therapy and again, measurable disease. And that's it, that's my time, thank you. Thanks to the two of you. Um, this has been such a tremendous session. I think it is, it is pointing to so much towards a future where we actually interfere with crucial biological mechanisms in the disease. There was one question from Günther Richter who was asking, or he, he was mentioning that he saw HDEC1 and 2 in LSD-containing complexes, and was he's asking if you thought about combining it with um, HDEC inhibitors, the drug. I, I assume that goes to the both of you. Emily, did you want to take that first? Or we certainly looked at HDEC inhibitors in our own lab and combining with chemotherapy is simple. I'm, my lab is pretty simple in terms of cell lines and just doing combination indices and HDEC inhibitors seem to also have some activity um, with that same I would say ours is, the, the looks we've taken have been pretty simple but have been basically the same. Well, there is a little bit of, of, of synergy. Second question, how about by using, Martin. by Martin McCabe, how about using a randomized uh, TC plus minus seclidemstat design? Thank you, Martin. I mean, an excellent question and definitely on, it definitely uh, makes sense. Uh, at, the, at the moment, um, the, the company, it, it, we did have an extensive discussion about this. And at the, at the moment, there's a search for a signal of activity um, I, I can understand how um, doing a three drug combination without a comparison arm is, is um, suboptimal. Uh, we do appreciate things like recurs data uh, as perhaps an eventual comparator. Um, uh, and so again, an important part of your study. Uh, so uh, we're looking for large differences right now as we are designed uh, between this, our expansion arm and the, the baseline from recur. Um, and we do know that uh, it in and of itself won't be enough, but it'll be just uh, informative for the company to make a decision about a more formalized uh, registrational or um, a randomized type study. What, what, one last question, the, like the low-grade um, fibromyxoid tumors, are those treated with chemo or is that the only the seclimestat um, drug treatment just because they are not treated by chemo usually because they are so indolent? 
It's tough, right? I mean, so yeah, so we do not expect to enroll any patients that have localized, you know, resectable tumors or anything like that. But um, we all have these, you know, benign metastasizing leiomyosarcomas. You know, they're, they're, it's sarcoma. So you get these low-grade tumors that metastasize, Evans tumor, for example, um, you know, and some of them do harbor EWS uh, R1 translocations. And so it's those odd patients where we don't really know what we're treating with. And so um, we just enrolled one in our center, treated with bisoptive first with, you know, poor tolerance, and then now is going on the study. But I, these patients really do lack a standard of care. We did debate about why do they need a prior line of therapy, but um, we just wanted to make sure people weren't weren't treating uh, benign things with with experimental chemotherapy. All right. So thank thank you everyone. This was a fantastic day. I'm really Uta. You have yes, I something to say. <laughs> no, you can continue, and I, I just wanted to say a few words, if I may. Actually, I, I, I think this, this has been a big inspiration and um, I'm, really, I'm, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about the spirit and the innovation of the community. That's basically, I'd, I'd like to say and hand over for you for housekeeping, the, like the party notes. The party notes, yeah.